I grew up in a very difficult time in that communists took over China. They um, sent out all the missionaries back to their own country. The country was struggling with poverty, uh, political stability. They tried to, to destroy all their enemies. They closed all the doors in, uh, of the church in China. They sent all the pastors to prison. And um, the slogan was to destroy all religion so that communist could be the, the, the main dominant thoughts. That was the situation. In uh, summer 1966, the government of China sent out thousands of red guards to all the Christians' homes to gather the Bible, hymn notes, um, devotional books, and they gathered them and burned them in the square in one day. In all the city squares throughout China, there was a day of burning and it was the burning of Bible. They came to my home to get the Bible. And it was early in the morning, we realized that our house was surrounded by hundreds of red guards and soldiers and police. And we just wondered why they, they surrounded our home. And we sent something very strange. Uh, in that morning, there was a brother who was a farmer. He was on his way home. And he felt the inner urge in his heart to come to visit us. And uh, he said, Lord, I did not contact them for a while. I did not tell them I was coming. It's impolite to just come, show up. But when he was on the way home, the inner urge was stronger. So he, he turned around and he came to my home. And just before the red guards came to my home to collect the Bible, he knocked at the door, he came in and asked my parents, what can I do for you? And my father said, take this Bible and go. And he took the Bible and left. And they thought that he was selling things to us. They did not stop him. When you ask me if God is involved, when a guy rides a bicycle up to the door and you happen to feel prompted, to give the guy the Bible, and then a hundred of the Red Guard arrived to take the Bible that's now gone with the guy on the bicycle. Was God involved in that? Every single detail. Every single detail. God is absolutely sovereign. There's not one rebellious molecule on the face of this earth or in this universe that is acting against His will. Everything is conformed to His will. He even uses evil. He, he uses everything. This is what, what theologians call providence. Every detail is controlled by God. The prompting in that guy's heart, the showing up with the bicycle, the prompting on the part of the Father to give the Bible, the timing, God has his purposes in all those things. And in particular, of course, with his own people for his own ends. This is clearly the providence of God working. They came for the Bible. And they came in, they searched the house, they uh, could not find the Bible, so they, they dug into the floor, they um, destroyed the windows and the doors, took away all the furniture, they went to the roof, they went everywhere to look for the Bible, and when they could not find it, they began to bring the family outside of the house and torture the family. Uh, for three days and three nights, in which we were not allowed to go to sleep. Uh, they beat my dad, my mom, and they beat the children in front of the parents, just to force them to deny Christ, and none of us did. They asked my older brother to deny Christ, and they asked him to make a choice. You want communism or Christianity? And my brother say Christianity. And he was taken out by a group of red guard and they beat him. They beat him until blood came out internally. 
There's a common saying among believers, and it is this. The blood of the martyrs always becomes the seed of the church. I'll give you an illustration of it. The strongest church in Asia, the strongest church in Asia, the one that Daniel comes from, is the most persecuted church. It's the church in China. You go to Japan. Japan had 250 missionary boards at one time ministering in Japan. All kinds of Christian institutions, Christian ministries all over. And it is a totally pagan culture. On the other hand, you go to China and, and you're going to find several hundred million Christians in a country where Christians were massacred. W why is that? Because that's a purifying process. Hypocrites all abandon religion. They're not going to be phony for something that costs them their life. What is the outcome of that? Tremendous expansion of the gospel because of the credibility that that develops. And a Christian sister was sympathetic and she gave my mom five dollars and say, take your son to the hospital and see what, what the doctor could do to help him. And uh, they took him, they examined him, and they told my mom that he's going to die. And my mom said, Lord, poverty and other persecutions are fine, but don't take away my son. But the Lord did not answer my mom's prayer. My brother died. And before he died, he said, Mom, come and pray for me. I'm going. And my mom prayed for him. And after the prayer, he closed his eyes with a smile. And when the doctors and the nurses saw um, all the situation, they said to my mom, the God that you worship is real. We've been here for so long, we've never seen any person die in this way. I am absolutely 100% convinced that the weakness of the church in America, the superficiality of the church, the shallowness of the church, the hypocrisy of the church is directly related to the absence of any cost or any price to pay to be a Christian. If you don't have to pay a price, hey, jump on the bandwagon. If persecution came to America, you'd see a very different kind of Christianity. A whole lot of people who are real eager to talk about Jesus wouldn't be talking about Jesus anymore. Who profess to, to, to know Jesus and to be a part of the church, they would stop talking very fast if the price was as high as it is for some people. Enter into history by just one person. And likewise, righteousness can enter into history by one person. How could one man save the world? It can't. Why? Because sin enter, enter into the world by just one man. And by contrast, righteousness can enter into the human race by one man too. Right? So it's fair. There were many reasons why I wanted Daniel Wong to be on the faculty of the Master's College. But, but a few of those reasons, and there are many. He's a man of prayer who spends, I think, two or three hours every day of his life in prayer. He's a man of scripture. He's writing a series of New Testament commentaries. He, he's a brilliant scholar, but he understands persecution. He understands it firsthand. Our young people don't understand it. We need him. If we can't have it firsthand, we need to learn its power secondhand. And also, he has seen the providence of God work in ways that are life and death ways. And in those ways that God preserves his word. That is a priceless treasure to give to the students of this college who have the privilege of sitting in class day in and day out with him and hearing the word of God and of course hearing his own experiences of its application. Sin used to be a master and it take us to sin, and we were slave to sin, we could not do anything else but to sin. But God has broken the tie. We have died to sin, and sin can no longer be master over us. God is very, very gracious to me, 
and He has brought me here so that I can invest my life in the life of the students here. I work very hard. I make sure that I understand the Word of God and that I communicate it clearly, accurately, concisely, so that people will know how beautiful, how sweet, how glorious, how important the Word of God is, so that they will love the Word, keep the Word, and through all of this, know the God of the Word.